Hey guys, so this is Miss Clayton here. This is going to be my first time recording myself. So if at any time you hear anything in the background, just ignore it and we will move right on through it. Um, as you know, yesterday we took our test on Unit 2. So today we're going to move into Unit 3, which is all about life science and cells. And I'm so excited because this is my favorite unit ever. Um, we are going to start today with discussing cell theory. And while we discuss this, you are going to need to, in your composition book, to take notes on this. So if you flip to the next blank page, and you should have a title page for Unit 3, and then on the next page, we are going to start by taking notes on cell theory. So your title for all of this should be cell theory, all right? All right, after you have that set up, we're, let's go ahead and get started. Cell theory is the scientific theory that describes the properties of cells. So this is the structure, the function, how they operate inside living things. Now, cell theory is made up of three tenets, okay? And another word for that might be beliefs or principles, all right? Now, we're going to discuss these once you have some background knowledge. All right, so what we're going to do first is discuss six main scientists who are responsible for gathering and discovering the information that was needed to build cell theory. So the first scientist that we are going to talk about is responsible for actually discovering cells. This took place in 1665, and this scientist's name was Robert Hooke. And he actually discovered cells while he was looking at a thin slice of cork underneath a very simple microscope. Um, and what he noticed is that when he looked at the cork underneath, underneath this simple microscope, that it looked like it was divided up into rooms like you might have in your house. And what he compared it to was cells or thing, the rooms that you might see in a jail. Okay, so jail cell, all right, that might be where he got the name from, who knows. Or um, the, the rooms that you might see in a monastery that the monks lived in, which is what he was familiar with. Okay, so that was his main contribution to cell theory was that he actually discovered cells while looking at a thin slice of cork. The next scientist that we are going to discuss um, is Antoine van Leeuwenhoek. I know, right? Try saying that um, two, three times fast. So, in 1673, Antoine van Leeuwenhoek used a handmade microscope to observe the gunk uh, no, I know, nasty, right? The gunk on his teeth and pond scum. And when he looked at these underneath that handmade microscope, he observed little tiny single-celled organisms. And he called these single-celled organisms animalcules. And the reason he called them this is because they looked like tiny animals. Okay, now, in, in addition to all of these things that he did that we just talked about, he is also known as the father for microbiology, and he is best known for the contributions that we just discussed, so him discovering single-celled organisms called animalcules. Now, the next type of scientist that we are going to discuss really comes after a 150 to 200 year gap. And the reason that there was this huge gap is because back in this time period, people really believed in this widely accepted um, belief in spontaneous generation. Okay, and this was the belief that living things come from non-living things. Okay, so in other words, people really thought back then, for example, that worms and frogs, simple organisms like that, could come from mud and from dust. Now, today we know that you have to have sexual reproduction in order to get those two things, but back then they really thought that, that, that those two living things or things like that could come from nothing, that they didn't have to come from living things, okay? So we're going to talk about one scientist who is really responsible for disproving that theory of spontaneous generation, and his name is Louis Pasteur, okay? So there was much doubt that existed around this belief of spontaneous generation, and um, back in the 19th century, Louis Pasteur is the scientist who conclusively disproved this. And he did this by a very simple experiment that he conducted. And what he did was he had two flasks with S-shaped necks. So if you look at the neck in the picture, you notice that it looks like an S, that an S, 
right? Now, what he did was he filled these two flasks with vegetable broth. And when he filled these two flasks with, vest with vegetable broth, he boiled them. And when he boiled them, as you all know, you kill whatever is in there. That's why most people say before you drink dirty water, you need to boil it so you can drink it, right? Because it kills all of the microorganisms in it. So that's what he did with his vegetable broth was he boiled his broth. Now, when he did this, the S shape of the neck of the flask allows for air to get in and microorganisms to get in, but not to get past that S shape curve. So that first curve, okay? So he's allowing air and microorganisms in, okay? But not allowed to get into the broth. And what he observed was when he left this out and open to the air and to the microorganisms, that with this S shaped neck, Okay, there was no microorganisms living in there. And this, this broth sat out, guys, for over a year, and there was still no growth of microorganisms in there. However, he discovered that when that neck was removed and all of that air and microorganisms were allowed to freely go in and out of the flask, that the microorganisms grew in the broth. Okay, so in other words, when you leave your flask or when you leave things open to air and to microorganisms, you're going to get the growth of microorganisms. So microorganisms come from other microorganisms. They don't just spontaneously generate. Okay, and this is what ultimately disproved that um, belief in spontaneous generation. Okay, so thanks to Louis Pasteur, that is no longer an acceptable belief. Now, the second, um, sorry, the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth scientists that we are going to talk about are all really the main people responsible for the development of cell theory. Okay, so German botanist Matthias Schleiden, okay, he concluded that all plant parts are made of cells. And he was very close friends with a German physiologist named Theodore Schwann. And they both happened to work at the exact same German university. And what they noticed was that whether they looked at plant parts or whether they looked at animal tissue, they still noticed that both of these things were made of cells. Okay, so these two scientists are really the main people responsible for stating that both plants and animals are both composed of cells. Okay, so that was their main contribution. The next person who is responsible for really coming up with the next tenet of cell theory is Rudolf Virchow. All right, now he, again, was a German physician, um, and he did an extensive study with cellular pathology. Okay, so pathology is the study of disease. So what he was trying to figure out was how diseases spread. And we knew that obviously it's not going to come from spontaneous generation because you have to have life to get life. And cells are obviously alive. So what he concluded was that cells, okay, have to arise or have to come from pre-existing cells, okay? So you get cells from other cells. Got it? All right. In conclusion with that then, if you add up all of these things that these scientists have discovered, okay, all of the information that they've gathered. Then, last but not least, you get the three cell theory components, or these three main tenets, the three basic components. Um, they were now complete. So, number one, in the one, number one, the first cell theory component is that all organisms are composed of one or more cells. Number two is that the cell is the basic unit of life in all living things, whether it's plants or animals. And then number three, that all cells are produced by the division of pre-existing cells. So there's no spontaneous generation. You get cells from other cells. Life comes from life. All right, so when you put all the discoveries and all of the components together, you're going to get these three basic tenets, these three basic beliefs of cell theory, all right? Now, you definitely need to write these down. These are probably the most important information out of this whole PowerPoint, all right? So, number one, all organisms are composed of one or more cells. 
Two, the cell is the basic unit of life in all living things. And three, all cells are produced by the division of pre-existing cells. Kind of makes sense. Now, what you're going to do after you have taken notes on this is we are going to actually make a foldable that is going to be glued into the next blank page of your notebook that is going to help you remember the three basic components of cell theory. Because if you just try to memorize it, then it can be a little hard. So to help you remember it, we are going to make a foldable. It's going to have words and pictures, all right, so to help you remember it. All right, so once you've taken notes on this, go back, review, see if you understand it all, and then we are going to get started making our foldable.